We can't go a little baseball, a little Mets, a little Yankees, and do kind of a mix, get your calls in early here on the baseball, and we'll get into everything else, the football as well, a little bit later on the program. But you know, for the Yankees, it's you know we, we talked about them fattening up on the schedule. They didn't do it over the weekend against the Mets out at City Field. Uh, they were able to do it Monday afternoon against the Twins, and they did it last night down in Camden Yards. So you got home runs from anybody that could hit a home run outside of Gleyber Torres last night hit a home run, whether it be Luke Voigt, DJ LeMahieu, Giancarlo Stanton, Aaron Judge. I mean, everybody, Joe Gallo, Gallo yep. hitting a home run. Everybody's hitting home runs down in Camden Yards and a nice oh, um, 7-2 victory. And you look at, you know, Cole was effective for his five innings of work. I mean, he threw a lot of pitches, but he was able to battle his way through it. Uh, you know, after missing a little bit of time dealing with that hamstring injury, King did a nice job giving... Aaron Boone and company, multiple innings. We know it's a lifeless Baltimore team, but a team that the Yankees have not fattened up on and beaten up on up until this point in time. And now it's go time. I mean, they've they've really got no other choice. You, you've got to you got to sweep Baltimore. Next game up is the most important game. So they have the victory last night. I know Glaber makes an error at second base, and you know that's going to raise people's eyebrows. And listen, he was a significantly better player at second base. He's just right now all messed up in between the years, and the Yankees had no other choice to move him from shortstop over to second base. But for the Yankees right now, they're in a dogfight with the Red Sox and the Toronto Blue Jays. To see which one of those two, which one of those three teams is the odd team out in the mm. AL wild card race, because I do think it ultimately comes down to those three, and the Yankees have to take care of business right now, as Elvis Presley used to say, uh, take care of business right now, and they got to go out there and sweep away Baltimore, take care of business against Texas, take care of business against Cleveland before the schedule, Maggie, gets a little bit more difficult. Nice, an Elvis drop. I didn't yeah, see that one coming today, but it's good for you. I Two things out of this game that I was looking for. One, that Garrett Cole comes out unscathed, right, and doesn't look like he had trouble with his hamstring, at least nothing apparent to any of us. We'll see how he res- responds after that. He was pitching with a brace on his leg, said it was a little uncomfortable, but was able to ultimately get through it. So that's the number one thing you're looking at for the Yankees. And the second thing I was looking at was what does Glaber Torres do now that he's at second base? He spoke to the media before the game and basically said, you know, listen, I love to give some grace to guys when English is not their first language. I appreciate that Glaber's doing this in English and, and explaining himself, but it didn't you didn't really get the sense that this was his idea. <laughs> you know, it wasn't I don't think he volunteered to be demoted basically from shortstop of the Yankees to second base. And so you were wondering how that was going to affect his confidence. We all think it's going to, you know, boost his confidence because, you know, you're going back to a position where you made all-star teams and stuff like that. But I wonder if there was something about it that maybe could have knocked his confidence too. It is a demotion. You know, you still are feeling the same amount of pressure, I think, because you're playing infield and starting every day for the New York Yankees. He had the error. He hasn't really been as effective at the plate. So, you know, I'm curious about that, and, and I'm curious about the future of Glaber, quite frankly. You know, where does he fit in with this team in 2022? You have, you know, big things, I think, on the horizon for the Yankees in terms of where they're going to look at shortstop. I don't I don't think Gio Urshel is it. We love the Velasquez story. I don't think that's it. I think the Yankees could really be big game hunting here in the offseason for the shortstop position. So with DJ LeMahieu, who can play so many roles for you, you know, where does Glaber fit in? You know, I've seen Glaber a little bit in some of those like trendy kind of like who could be traded in the off season type of thing. And, you know, I wonder what the future is for Glaber Torres. You know, he's got such incredible talent that we've seen before, but ultimately, you know, is he the guy, the move that gets made that really shakes up the Yankees? And, you know, I'm wondering if this move to second, if he continues to struggle defensively and, you know, if he doesn't really show a turnaround here in the last couple of weeks of the season, you know, what is the future of Glaber Torres where at one point, Moose, he was untouchable, could not be traded. You know, he's yeah, so young. I don't think he's going to get moved. But at some point, if the Yankees are going to change their identity, you know, if they still feel like they need to do that, right? I mean, Judge is having such a good year. It is just it, he is covering, I think, for a lot here with the Yankees. Now they're going to get fat on these bad teams, hopefully, and hopefully they have a long playoff run. But you know, let's not forget the first three months of the season. We're talking about what's wrong with the Yankees. What's wrong with the Yankees? And at some point, you're going to have to shake something up. And I wonder if Glaber becomes that guy. He's still young enough where you can get 
a, I think a decent return because yeah, not a great return. But because he's, the he, value is extremely low on but, a player. But you've seen it before, right? Like if I'm a team that's trading right, for but, him, I have seen it. Right, but I'm not also paying top market value. Well, so if I'm the Yankees, I'm not trading Glaber Torres. But you could also wait around another season, and you don't know if you're getting another down season from Glaber Torres, where you could have had a chance to upgrade. Like the Yankees are going to have yeah, to make I, some kind of move here. No, no, I I get it, and you know we're. I, I don't I think Glaber's gonna be the Yankees second baseman. I don't think they're moving him. I, I don't. I think the Yankees have shown you patience with a lot of young players. I think they're not gonna all of a sudden not show the patience with a player that they really, really like. I think when Aaron Boone tells you all you need to know about the organization when he was basically asked the question, you know, well, why are you kind of the domino effect of moving Glaber to second base, why, you know, it's affecting a lot of other positions. And he said, well, he's important to us. He's important to us when we get going. He's, I believe that Glaber Torres is going to play a pivotal role to this team offensively. That says a lot about, and that is. I'd expect not, Aaron that is to not, say nothing less. Well, that is not Boone's just speaking out of turn. That is the organization. And you've seen it with other younger players. You've seen it with Clint Frazier. You've seen it with Miguel Andujar. You've seen it with Gary Sanchez. You've seen it. I, I don't think the Yankees would uh, get humbled to the point on Glaber Torres where they're going to trade him at. 50 or 60 cents on the dollar. Yeah, but think about it. I, Frazier and Andujar are, are cautionary tales now because yeah. you could have traded them at a time when you could but have gotten my something point and is didn't. They've been, they've been patient with their young players. Right. They've held on to their young players. So at I don't some points think to a fault. Glaber Torres is a significantly better player than Clint Frazier, mm-hmm. is a significantly better player than Miguel Andujar, and we've already seen it. I, I think he's probably, you know, all around, he's a better player than Gary Sanchez when they're both at their peak, even though offensively, Gary presents something a little bit different at the catcher spot. Yeah, I mean, I, I think Glaber's going to be the Yankee second baseman. And I'm also, I, I think he's so messed up in the head right now. The defense, the error that he made at second base last night, you know, didn't surprise me. It really didn't. Um, I think he'll clean it up. It might not have been his idea. The Yankees were left with no other choice. You can't continue to roll Torres out there as you have playing a lot of one-run games. Uh, outside of last night, there's not a lot of margin games, and you know you have a you don't have a, a, a clear line here or a lot of room to play with um, as a team to win these games. You can't be giving away outs, and they were giving away outs at, at shortstop consistently with Torres. And I think I, I think it came down to it where I think probably pitchers were getting frustrated by it, um, and I think Aaron Boone made the decision. Listen, we need to get him going offensively. We need to get his mind right. And the best way to do it is get him off a position right now where he has little to no confidence that he could feel the position. But I also don't think they're they're going to give up on him in the offseason. But, I mean, that's that. it'll be an interesting offseason to also decide how does this season look? How does it end? Does it end with the Yankees in the playoffs? Does it end with the playoff on the outside looking in? Do they make a managerial change? There's a lot of things that come into play about how the Yankees look next season. If they make the playoffs, how does it look? Do they win the wild card game? Do they win the division series? Do they get to the ALCS? Do they get hot once again? So I think all of those things factor in. Now you can make the argument, well, it shouldn't. You know, there there needs to be some changes to this team. And I would probably agree with you. I yeah. mean, I would agree. I don't, think, you know? I don't think it starts with Glaber Torres. I, I don't. I, I think you could see a change behind home plate with Gary Sanchez. I think you could look at Gio Urshela not playing a significant role on this team. You know, you go ahead, say, a, a big-time shortstop. Well, the Yankees have two, two big shortstop prospects down in their farm system mm-hmm. that a lot of people are really, really high That's on. That's true. And, you know, listen, you know it's the Yankees, so money really <laughs> shouldn't be an object, but it definitely is. You know, the Yankees are pretty open about that. Hal Steinbrenner's open about that. So how many huge salary players are you realistically going to have on this team? You already have Stanton as a huge salary. You already have Cole as a huge salary. Yes. Judge is playing so well this year. He's one year. He's got next year and then free agency. But, like, you know, you could start that conversation about the Aaron Judge and, like, you know, what's going to be the number on that contract. And then you're going to add a big-time shortstop. That could be, a you know, huge money also. Like, at some point – how many guys are you going to end up paying? And Gary Sanchez would be one year away from free agency. You'd see about that. Like, I, I just, there's a realism part of this with the Yankees, which I know we don't love to talk about because the Yankees sometimes feel like fantasy land because they add so much talent all the time. And look what they did at the deadline and all that stuff. But I think there is a real life component to this, which is how many like 200 million plus, you know, dollar players are you going to have on your payroll? 
Yeah, I, I don't I don't know that answer. I, I don't know. I don't know what the contract is going to look like for Aaron Judge. I also don't know look, what the contract eventually, if he turns out, will look like for Glaber Torres. Um, or you know, Gary. But, yeah, Gary. Gary's not Gary's going to be a $200 not, million. Dollar. Gary's, Gary would be lucky to get $60 million, <laughs> well, I mean, with the way that he's played. So I know, Gary's not going to get paid like that, but I, I get the point. It's going to be point. something. Yeah, he, he's going to get you, something. And you have DJ, who's almost not near, he's near $100 million. Well, he's at 95 yeah. I mean, that is very, that's a very, very pro team contract. Did, yeah. I mean, that's a contract where if he they, continues had, to age well, they sure. had DJ over the barrel there. He was desperate to be a Yankee, and they took advantage of it to get the number where he was looking, and they spread it out over six years. I mean, DJ LeMay, who when he's right at $15 million a year, not bad, uh, is, is a bargain when you look at it for Yankees. But ultimately, right now, you're a Yankee fan. You wake up on this Wednesday morning. Not to mention they're in a first. Flat-footed, what yeah, are they doing in, at that? They're first in a flat-footed place. tie here uh, with the Jays and with the Red Sox in the AL wildcard race. And that's all. And you know what? Next game, most important game. They took care of business against the Baltimore Orioles last night. Now it's a matter of a next man up, next game up, and they got to go out there and continue to win these games. And then you get to the Mets last night out at City Field, where do we have to once again? Yeah. I, well, I mean, what a what a tremendous game it was. I mean, four and a half hours of just, oh, what a what a <laughs> tremendous baseball game. Four and a half what hours last <laughs> night. It was just an absolute. Slop fest of a game. There was no pace to it whatsoever. Uh, and you go play, and the game goes into extra innings, and you get the Baez home run that ties it up. And then you get, you know, uh, Embry getting out of it um, in the top half of the 10th inning, inducing a double play. I think the first double play is induced this entire year. I think that's what Gary Cohn mentioned last night. Then you have guys on first and third, la- and then you have guys on first and third, Lindor, amazingly enough. You know, swings at a changeup, doesn't get ball up in the air, you know, rolls over it right to the first baseman, Goldschmidt. Goldschmidt turns an unbelievable double play. Mm. Taps on first, throw home to Molina. Molina over to Arenado. Arenado tags out Pilar to end that one. They put up three runs then in the top half of the 11th inning. Mets end up losing the game by one run. Nine straight losses now for the Mets by one run, which is a new major league record. And you know, after the game, you get into, once again, the decision-making of, of Luis Rojas in the dugout. And, you know, people are hammering him about the decision to take out Marcus Stroman after six innings of work. Stroman didn't throw his manager under the bus. Angry Stroman is every time he hits the podium for some reason. But last night, um, you know, he didn't throw his manager under the bus, said, you know, I can't. I could have went out there in the next inning and given up three home runs. You know, you know, Familia's done the job. Other guys have done the job. And, you know, they, it just wasn't our night tonight. So good job by Stroman not throwing his manager under the bus. But once again, a curious decision by Rojas. And the other thing is, is I just don't understand. If these are must-win situations for the Mets, you know, to have go into a game where, you know, you don't have Lugo um, and you don't have Castro, you go into it where you're hamstrung. You're bringing in a guy in the top half of the 11th inning in Reed that just came off the disabled, the IL, mm. I should say, uh, correct myself, I don't understand for games that you have to win, and there is this is not this is September. It's not May. It's not June. Guys, not being available at this stage for the Mets as you're trailing where you needed to win, you win that game. You're two and a half games back in the wild card race in the National League for cementing a playoff spot, and you have guys going into that game against the Cardinals that are unavailable in a game the night before that you gave a lifeless effort? That made no sense. I don't understand where the lack of urgency is coming from here. I, I don't get it, I, I and I and I won't, and I've already emotionally kind of blocked myself off. Most I'm in, I'm in the bunker. I've been in the bunker with the Mets, but that doesn't mean that you know, these aren't disappointing losses to watch, and so many managerial decisions. I mean, the pitching stuff for sure. You know, Familia now giving up home runs left and right. I mean, listen, Trevor May has given up home runs left and le- right. So put one guy in, put the other guy in. I mean, May was eventually able to get out get out of the inning. May has the better track record, I guess, this year, but they've both been giving up home runs. Aaron Loop's been your best guy. Can he not go a second inning there? Maybe you can flip-flop them. Maybe Jerry's Familia can face, like, the lesser guys in the lineup, and maybe Loop can be there, you know, to get through the heart of the order, considering you brought Loop in the seventh inning, and he faced all righties anyway. So it's not even like you were trying to do the lefty Bottom thing. Bottom third of the order, too. That's what I'm saying. Why yeah. not have Loop for the heart of the order as opposed to Familia? Let him have the softer part. And like that, and even the, the smaller stuff, like, so remember when Evan got into it with Luis Rojas? And this was a much, much more stark, you know, example where you brought up Patrick Mazika to pinch hit in a big situation instead of J.D. Davis because yeah. you were trying to play the righty-lefty matchup there. And Evan was like, no, but Luis... 
Davis, Davis is, is a better, better player, player right. than Mazika, right? This isn't to that extent, but I still have to believe that Luis Guillorme doesn't matter about the righty lefty matchup at that point. He has better numbers pinch hitting than Albert Almoro. Moose, do you want to know Albert Almoro is a pinch hitter? Both he and Luis Guillorme both have 14 plate appearances as pinch hitters this season. Do you know what Albert Almora's line is? Pinch hit appearances in 2021. I'll tell you. Two hits? Zero. Oh, there you go. Zero, zero, zero. The slash line is nine zeros in a row. He doesn't even have a walk. Zero, 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 zero. At least Luis Guillorme at like 230 or something. He's got a walk. Albert Almora, six strikeouts in, play to, in 14 plate appearances. Luis Guillorme, only three. Like, what are we doing? I know it's not as stark as Mazika to Davis. I get it. Davis is a much better player than Mazika. But Luis Guillorme in that position, you got to go to him over Almora to, to forget the righty lefty. Like, Almora, nothing. I. I, yeah, I promised I, I, myself I wasn't going to scream about the Mets again this year because it's not worth it. But that one was really, really tough. And the other part that just made it even worse, right, made it even, like, harder, is that while you have the Mets game going on on SNY, you have the Mets 30 for 30 going on on ESPN where you're watching the 1986 team yeah. and what they kept saying, the part first two parts of the documentary, which is really good, what they keep saying about the 86 team, which is obviously much more talented than this team, we kept our foot on the gas. We kept our foot on the gas the whole season, our foot on the gas. And I know in 85 they had a disappointment, no wild cards back There's then. There's no analytics in that, in that era. Foot on the gas. Where is the foot on the gas? Like, what? What? why? Why? And so that was such a stark contrast as I'm watching this 86 team, which, again, is its own shooting star of a team and whatever. But, like, Foot on the gas. Yeah, the was way they the managed, common yeah. theme there. No, I get it. I mean, more talent. I mean, listen, that's there's, not a lot to compare. No, it, it's yeah, it's a difficult comparison when you look at the '86 team and how how gifted Boost that process group was. over results, my friend. The process, the foot on the gas, like the mentality. Well, that's, not, that's not part of the analytics process. I know it's not I mean, for the Yankees that either, is, but just that, for the Mets, that's not it's part killing of, me. That's not part of professional sports when you look at the process anymore. <laughs> so that, it's all about load management, giving guys off. Guys aren't. Guys aren't used the way that they are. I mean, Strowman last night was talking about the fact that maybe Rojas saved him. He's made 31 starts, didn't pitch at all last year, obviously opted out uh, due to COVID-19 and and said that maybe Rojas is is thinking about him and, and trying to protect him. I I also think, uh, well, yeah, I, the, I think in, and I kind of know, the analytics department has kind of taken away the feel of Rojas. No, oh, um, you think? It's, it's really... <laughs> It's really affected him to the point where, you know, a, a very, very good baseball man, I think, probably has been overwhelmed by a number of things. I think some of the personalities in that clubhouse, and I don't think that room is as good as it once was. And then the other thing that I think it's affected him where I think now you look at it where he's just a pure numbers guy instead of looking at the touch and the feel for the baseball game. And it's a shame because I, I do think Rojas is a guy that, um, I do think Rojas is a guy here that, uh, as a manager, will get another opportunity at some point in the major leagues. Maybe the inexperience, this is it. Uh, you've seen it rear its ugly head this year with the Mets. Um, but last night, you mentioned it. I mean, the Guillaume stuff, the decision to take out Stroman, and Stroman didn't throw him under the bus. You, you look at some of the managerial decisions that he's made in the dugout where it's just purely about stats, 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 or, or drilling down on it, looking at the sinker. You know, there's there's moments in sports. Guys are able to step up and perform. There are other guys that are built for certain moments when others, regardless of the righty-lefty splits, regardless of what a guy struggles up where he can maybe work a pitcher and surprise you. That's what sports is about. That is totally gone out of the decision-making process right now of Rojas. 877-337-6666. All right, we got the Yankees. We got the Mets for you. Baseball later. So Tiki Barber's going to join us this entire season. He's going to do it on Wednesdays this year. So thrilled to talk with him, get his thoughts on Saquon. Yes. Tiki did the Jets game on Sunday, and he did yeah, a fantastic job. Yeah, yeah. He did a great job. Great job. Yeah, he's really good at that, and he's a talented guy. All right, 877-337-6666. Your Yankees and Mets calls next. 